All right, everyone. Welcome again. Um, my name is Darren. If we haven't met before, or if we have met before, good to see you. Um, and welcome to the final installment. Oh, man, it's a little bit sad to say. The final installment of our uh, online series, uh, Convergence, Life and Faith. Um, so welcome again. If this is your first time joining, we're uh, New York Word Church, small church here in, in Astoria, Queens, part of New York City. And they say, <laughs> I was laughing, they say Queens is, uh, is the world's borough, but we quite literally have people joining from around the world today, which is fantastic. So welcome, welcome to everyone. Um, and um, yeah, so it's kind of the purpose of the series, if, uh, you know, if this is your first time, you know, we're kind of trying to solve one of those questions that so many people um, or so many Christians specifically you know, kind of deal with, and that's, you know, how do I reconcile this life of faith with this everyday life, right? I have, you know, these tasks, um, you know, work, school, chores, family, all these different things, you know, that we have to do in our, um, in our everyday life, but at the same time, you know, where, where does God fit into that? Where does, you know, where does church fit into that? How do I balance both of these things? Um, and I think we've learned a lot already in the first three weeks, but tonight we have a, a very special guest um, joining from DC. I'm, try, I'm trying to I'm trying to temper my excitement. Um, tonight we have Dr. Garrett Van Hoy, who is a, who's a close friend of mine. I'm glad to have him. And um, just to give a little background on Garrett, I know he'll, he'll go into it a little bit more, but Garrett is, get my notes so I get this right. Garrett has a doctorate in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Arizona. No big deal, right? Um, <laughs> that's not even the impressive part, honestly. The impressive part, well, one of the impressive parts, so as, as Garrett was a graduate student, he was already uh, lecturing at the University of Arizona. Um, and I just learned today, reading his bio, that two, two years in a row, he was named by the student body as the best lecture, lecturer in his department, which is pretty impressive. Um, so we have very high expectations for him today. <laughs> but um, so he's currently working near Washington DC for Periton Labs as a, uh, as a research scientist. And he's also, I believe he's an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland. Um, and if all that isn't, isn't impressive enough on its own, um, he's also heavily involved in, in church activities. He's, you know, he's a bit of a, you know, ministry pioneer in a sense, uh, you know, launching clubs and, and the sort on, on campuses in the DC um, area. He's, I believe he's involved in some mentorship programs and he'll, he'll probably touch on some of this, but, um, you know, I really respect and appreciate Garrett because every time I see him, you know, there's so, there's so much he could talk about, right? You know, in addition to all the professional ask accolades. I mean, he's an athlete, he's a home homeowner, all these different things. But the first thing on his heart that he always wants to talk about is ministry, right? He's like, you know, how are you guys in New York, you know, reaching campus students? How are you guys reaching young professionals, you know, and, and trying to share ideas? Um, you know, so I really appreciate that perspective that he has. And, and certainly, you know, similar to other speakers, he's someone who has not sacrificed his life of faith um, for the sake of, you know, professional pursuits, but, but really he's been able to, to bridge those two lives together. Um, and, and that's why we've asked him to come tonight. Um, before I turn the floor over to him, if I could ask Grace to please send out the question and answer form. Um, you know, so at the end of, of Garrett's, uh, Garrett's presentation, we'll have an opportunity to ask him a few questions. Um, and it's really, it's actually been my favorite part each week because we get to hear a little bit more specifically what, what's on everyone's mind. Um, and Garrett can share, you know, his experiences based on, on what you want to hear. I think I've, I've had to hold back tears in most of the Q&As thus far. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, so feel free to fill that out. Uh, Grace just dropped it in the chat. So feel free to, to put any questions in there as we go along. Um, but without further ado, uh, Dr. Van Hoy, the floor is yours, sir. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I feel uh, really, really humbled actually to be able to speak like this. 
Uh, you know, I've, I've been speaking in front of people, you know, for, for co in college for a lot of, you know, technical reasons, but I really appreciate uh, all of you coming to be able to just listen to stories that I want to share. Uh, these are things that are really near and dear to me, and I hope that the stories that I can share can also help you in your life of faith, because uh, yeah, as much as I, I might have all these accolades, I hopefully through what I talk about today, you will see really God helped me to be, to be able to actually make these kinds of things happen in a daily, on a daily basis in a really practical way. Uh, and so I hope that, you know, through, through some of these stories, you will also realize about your own situation and, and other things you may be going through. So yes, I, I'm very thankful uh, for, for this time to be able to share. So uh, without further ado, let me also get to the presentation. So let me just triple check as I always have to do. Can you guys see what I'm looking at right here? Yes, okay, yes, this is a standard practice. <laughs> I've been teaching on Zoom for some time as well. You gotta make sure that you know the tech is working to some degree. So just making sure you all can see this, okay? All right, so yes, uh, as Darren mentioned, so I kind of do uh, triple duty on certain things and I'll, I'll try to explain why, why I do that as well. But yes, I actually have a full-time position as a senior research scientist, and I also teach at a university in addition to doing uh, ministry at church. And all of these things are my passion, but they feed into each other, and they actually they empower each other so much. And that's why I keep doing it. So today I'm going to talk about a little bit how, how they actually do that in a practical sense. Uh, and I'll talk about a little bit of my backstory. Okay, so growing up, you know, I have both parents which are engineers, okay? both my mom and my dad kind of drilled into me, you know, about the mentality of an engineer, which is I want to solve my problems by making things. And, you know, that that stuck with me for a long time, but also I always focused on what was practical, almost no matter what. All right. And so in school, you know, I was I love math, I love science, I love technology because uh, it was fun. I had, you know, I had people to help me do it at home. Um, and there was many things I could do with it, right? But I was laser focused on what was actually practical more than anything else, okay? However, in high school, they make you do things like this. Okay, I don't know if you guys can see the, the text there. This may look like a Bible. It is not a Bible. <laughs> if I wish it were a Bible, but actually it's the Count of Monte Cristo. This book is not a page turner, at least for me at that age when I had to read it in ninth grade. This book is... Uh, Interesting, and I'm sure a lot of people might find use in it, but just to summarize the plot, what it's about is some guy gets betrayed by their friends, and he ends up getting exiled to this island, and then he gets stuck in prison for many years mulling over how he ended up there because he was actually betrayed. All right? he, he was betrayed by some friends, and so he met this guy in prison, and the, the guy in prison said, hey, I'll help you solve your problems by teaching you everything about life including how to speak various languages and, and all kinds of things. And what did he do with that knowledge? He went and got his revenge. That's what he did. Yeah, so this is what I read in ninth grade. And when, whenever I read these things in ninth grade, because of my practical mentality, I couldn't help but wonder like, oh, okay, so this is a manual on how to live life, right? So I'm supposed to like, you know, get betrayed by my friends and then I'm supposed to learn as much as I can so I can go kill my enemies. That's that's what I'm supposed to do, right? This is kind of the this is kind of you know what what I was getting out of it, especially in ninth grade. Uh, it was kind of hard. Can you guys still see the screen? I'm just uh, moving things around here. I apologize. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So you know this was the book that I had to read, and there were many other things because it's 1,200 pages, and I was like, what are you trying to say to me after 1,200 pages of all of this? And that's what I got out of it. So English was extremely frustrating. And oftentimes this is kind of the face that I made. Whenever I saw this kind of book, I was like, please don't make me read. Whatever book you want to make me read, please don't do that. But yeah, if you wanna, if you wanna make me do math, that's fine. Why? Because there was something I could get out of it, right? There was something I could make with it. There was, uh, whenever I saw math, I saw that I could change the world even at that young age. I was like, oh, this is the fundamentals of reality. If I actually learn how to do math, then what can I do? I can make things like rockets, right? This is a picture of uh, one of SpaceX rockets. It's not a real picture, uh, but it is, uh, you know, it's one of, their, one of their 3D graphics, right? But there is so much engineering that goes into those rockets and they genuinely do solve many problems for mankind. And so, you know, the way I always thought was math and science, that's how you solve problems. That is how we solve many problems in this world. And that's ultimately, 
you know, the thing that I carried with me at all times. So, you know, furthermore, just, just to put icing on the top. So when I was in high school, you know, they kept asking me to read these things, right? You know, the Count of Monte Cristo in ninth grade wasn't enough, but all the way to my senior year, they kept asking me to read various books. And one time while I was in high school, even though I was working, you know, I was studying all AP classes, I could handle all of that. But one time, this is exactly what I looked like when I was doing my English homework. And so my mom walked in and she's like, hey, Garrett, uh, what, what, what are you worried about? Because, you know, again, it's just not something I would typically do at that time. And I said, mom, you know, with like tears rolling down my face, mom, they asked me what the author's intent was. <laughs> and it was, it was, uh, it was, it was frightening because, you know, how am I supposed to know what the author's intent was in a book, right? For me, author's intent, this is like reading somebody's mind. How am I actually supposed to figure out what this author meant? And there are many stories on the web, even at that time, that people went to go ask the author what they meant, and they said nothing. Right? I meant literally nothing by this particular passage, right? So that stuck with me quite a lot. But while I was trying to write this one-page one page essay, you know, I kept thinking to myself, what, what's the point of finding out the author's intent anyway, and what's the point of this practice? So I kept this kind of mentality in, in almost everything that I did. Right. No matter how much I read these books, because it was a fictional story, I just couldn't build rockets with it. Right. <laughs> I hadn't yet, you know, built up my interest in, uh, you know, electrical engineering at that time, but I was very interested in making things. So I thought, yeah, you know, I can read these books, whatever. There's certain things I can get out of it. But if you can't build a rocket, don't ask me to read it from this point on. And so I was very happy to leave high school, you know, finally go to college to learn something more practical. Um, and that was kind of where I started. So I don't know how many STEM majors there are out, out there, right? If you guys are STEM majors, maybe you can feel a little bit about what I felt. A lot of my friends also whined in the same way, saying, why do I have to read this Bible of, of a piece of literature, but then get nothing out of it, right? So the thing is, is this also got into my faith, right? It actually affected the way I live my life of faith, and it affected how I approached faith as well. So how did it do that? Because I thought, what's the practicality of the Bible? I always wondered, you know, how am I supposed to use this book for more than just the afterlife? How am I supposed to use this book to solve real problems that I'm facing right now and even the, 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 the world's problems? So one thing I did understand is that in the Bible, there are many different kinds of writings. There are the Proverbs and there's Ecclesiastes, there's Song of Solomon. There's, there's lots of different kinds of literature. There's different kinds of writing in the Bible. And I understood, hey, you know, Proverbs, yeah, you can actually make stuff with Proverbs because I knew it's not all math and science. I didn't know teamwork is important. You know, being able to communicate well is important. And you can find those in the Bible. I got that part. That was, I could make that connection even at a very young age. The problem was when you got to these stories like Noah's flood, and I, I just wondered to myself, like, okay, so how do I solve the world's problem? Just build a boat. You know, very easy. It's how, it's how you solve all the world's problems. You know, no, you know, hunger, just build a boat. It's not, not, not a problem, right? So this is kind of, you know, as I was reading these stories, you know, even as a teenager, I started to wonder, you know, what's, what's the purpose of a story like this? Or, you know, Joshua is another famous story where all he had to do was, hey, just tell God to stop the sun. That's going to solve your problem, right? Or the last one is, hey, just don't eat a fruit. You know, this sounds very simple. I really, I... I can't tell you how much I wish life was that simple. <laughs> you know, at that time, I was like, man, if all I had to do is not eat a fruit, I, I would be golden. I'm very good at not eating fruits, <laughs> actually. So uh, it just happens to be one of my talents. So, <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe I can add that as a title. But anyway, um, yeah. So, I mean, this is what the Bible presented to me. And that's why I want to say they were often not told in church. Because it was really difficult to actually find what is the purpose of this story, right? So it just, it wasn't that simple. So how do we resolve this? And how did I go about resolving this? That's kind of what I want to talk about today, okay? So when I finally got to college, I was studying engineering. And there was a principle that I learned that would play into my faith later. This principle that I learned was you never, ever reinvent the wheel. It is forbidden. 
It is like a it is like a blasphemy in engineering to start from absolute scratch. You're not allowed to do anything like that, right? You need to use what other people have done in order for you to solve your problem. So, for example, a wheel. A wheel was invented a long time ago. So, but guess what? A wheel doesn't just solve the problem of moving something from A to B. It actually can be used for many different things, right? A wheel is something called a design pattern, right? It is this thing that solves a particular problem. But as you can see, I've laid this out in a hierarchy that, you know, there are tires that just move vehicles from A to B, but a Ferris wheel is a wheel. And so is a water wheel that actually turns a turbine for the sake of, uh, you know, uh, processing wheat and things like this. So it's a design pattern, right? So even though, you know, the original invention of the wheel might have had this particular purpose of moving things, what we learn in engineering is that you need to know these design patterns because if you know them, then you can apply them in various different situations according to your situation. So that's what these people that did the Ferris wheel did. And that's what people that, you know, that made this uh, water wheel as well. They learned many different things, even turbines are wheels. So this is the algorithm, right? This is the last part of engineering I'm gonna talk about too much today. So don't, don't, be, don't be too worried. <laughs> I'm not gonna teach you all of engineering today. That's uh, it's a little bit much in a 20 minute session. But yes, how do I design? You first have to do yourself to put yourself in the shoes of the person who designed it. Right, so that person that made the wheel, you got to think, why? What are they trying to do with this wheel? Once you understand what they're trying to do, then you understand what constraints were they working with. Right, when that wooden wheel was made, they didn't have steel mills. Right, they were not able to manufacture carbon fiber. All they had were trees around them. Right, that's a constraint that they had. Right, understand what their goals were by making this thing. Understand how they arrived at all the possible solutions. How did they get to that one thing? And then the key part, you take what they did, all of that information, and you figure out how is that the same or different from what you're doing? Because if it is different, you need to adjust. If it is the same, then you can take it as it is and it should succeed. However, if you don't consider that, then the design pattern becomes a disaster, right? Because you end up using the wrong solution for the wrong problem. Uh, and that's the other part of this, right? So you have to adjust it from there. So where, where am I going with this? So when I was early in college, I was learning a Bible study from somebody. And at that time, I was talking to him about these design patterns. And one thing that he told me, he's like, you know what? You can actually understand the Bible in the same way. And I was actually kind of shocked and interested. I was like, really? Like, I remember all, learning all these things. And it was pretty much completely disconnected from the reality I was living. So as I explained earlier, so I was like, okay, show me. Right. So ultimately, from what I learned from that Bible study, I was able to resolve this tension between my life of faith and my career and other parts of my life. What I was able to realize when he taught me this, and I'm going to talk about what he taught me, is that, yeah, when you have practical knowledge of the world and practical knowledge of being able to interpret the Bible and you have faith, then you can make amazing results from all of those kinds of things here, right? And so that was what ultimately changed my life early on in college was being able to have that power to make those two things work together rather than, you know, I'm just balancing it. I'm making them feed into each other and making it so that it's, it's something that allows me to go even further than I was able to go before, right? So let's talk about some situations I ran into, right? And I want you, as I talk about this, to think about your own situations, right? So let's say you're in this position where you have this amazing, great hope for the future, right? You have this great idea for where you're going to go in life. But guess what? You're overwhelmed by school, work, family, other obligations. All of those things are weighing you down in your pursuit of getting to this tree. And at some point, it becomes like there's so much for you to do. You're just like, you know what? Let's just take all of this and cut it in half. And maybe I can maybe I can begin to understand what the heck I'm doing from that point on. All right, this is something that I, I've been in this situation many times before. But guess what? There is a design pattern about this in the Bible. Okay, there's this guy named Joshua. Right? I talked about him earlier. We're not going to talk about you know how he just magically stopped the sun, so to speak, but it's related here. So this was four thousand years ago. 
he also had this amazingly great hope to take the land of Canaan, right, which had belonged to his ancestors. Really great promise, right? Because, you know, just literally 40 years earlier, they were slaves. So now they were able to have their own land. But guess what? He was looking at this conquest that looked like it would take his entire lifetime. That's so overwhelming to think about that this could be the rest of my life and the life of my son and the life of his son and so on and so forth, right? Not only that, he probably would have survived if he just stayed where he was because it's not like he was in immediate danger. Uh, He was actually in a relatively safe place, but guess what? God asked him, hey, you can do it. So this is the situation he was in, which was very similar to what many of us actually many of us actually face. So how did he solve it? Number one, he tackled everything one at a time. Even though the conquest looked so big, he just split it up into small chunks and he just did it one after another, after another, after another. Another thing he did, he received this inspiration from God, be bold. And it just so turns out that the first city he attacked they were actually more afraid of him than he was of them. And that's often the case, right? Oftentimes tasks or whatever you're doing, it seems so insurmountable, but it's sometimes it's quite small when you first actually approach it, right? So that was one thing he did and be positive, right? He had this positive mentality, no matter what he saw. Yeah, there are problems. He saw all of those problems. And as an engineer, I don't, I know what it's like to think only about the problems. I have absolutely worked with people like this, and I've also been tempted to do this, but Joshua focused on what would work. Okay. So what, what did I experience like this in my graduate school? I also had this great vision. I'm going to get a PhD in electrical engineering. I'm going to get lots of teaching experience. I'm going to maintain my life of faith about doing all of that. I'm not going to drop anything. That was kind of where I was going to go. And guess what? My friend just about at the end of all this told me, hey, you know, only 60% of people in graduate school like you actually even finish in seven years. Not only that, they're not even teaching. They're just doing research. So, you know, I had a lot of apprehension about trying to go until the end in graduate school, thinking about why am I doing so much? I could easily just, you know, for example, I could just you know, let it go. You know, I don't need to teach while I'm doing these kinds of things. I have so many options already because at that time I had a few degrees. So how did I go about solving it? Well, many times during that period of time, I thought about Joshua a lot. And I I thought about his situation and how did it apply to my situation? Many times when I was feeling like this is impossible, I simply sat down and wrote down everything that I was doing without thinking about how much work it would be. And I would prioritize. I would get rid of things I didn't need to do. I would make it so that, you know, it became something I could do one at a time, one day at a time, right? Then I also thought creatively. Rather than just saying, hey, this is my limit, and I just said, this is where I am, I I tried to say, I tried to keep imagining, you know, yes, I can do it. Yes, even though it's difficult, I can find a way to do it. And the last thing is, I tried to focus on how things would go well rather than how it would go wrong because that was the easy part, thinking about how it would go wrong at that time. So what what actually happened? Well, I graduated. So I got to wear this really fancy suit. You know, actually a lot of my friends made fun of me because the hat looks like the Sesame Street uh, chef hat. I think it does too. Uh, (laughs) You know, that is is kind of the thing. I guess, you know, once you get to that level, you just make yourself look silly. So anyway, I graduated and this is my family and my advisor. And I was just, I was, I was in disbelief on that day. I really couldn't believe that I had actually finished it at all. Furthermore, because of my time spent with my students and because I was able to strategize and use these kinds of things, my students did vote me as one of the best lecturers in the the department twice in a row. So that picture there in the bottom right, That is my students dressing up as me for Halloween. Because they noticed that I always wore jeans and I put these like these uh, these sunglasses up on my head. You know, they just thought it would be hilarious to dress up as me for Halloween. And that day it was just it was just a, a surreal moment for me because I really poured out everything for them. 
you know, thinking about a lot of these stories in the Bible, I really was so inspired saying, these people are like my family. I want to take care of them with all of my heart. Yeah. And this is the kind of thing that they did. At least they felt comfortable enough to make fun of me. So I felt glad about that. Yeah. And the other thing on the left is, yeah, this is something I taught them to make. So they put it on their graduation hat as well. And so these are the kinds of things that, that I experienced continuously trying to, you know, apply what I learned from the Bible. Okay. So thinking about that one thing, the Bible has many other things just like that, right? There are so many other stories in the Bible that are just like that. Leadership is a really big topic in industry and in, uh, in professional environments as well, right? Jesus and Apostle Paul both showed the kind of leadership that even though people face death, they, these two people were able to lead people in a way that they were able to overcome all of their limitations and still do what they needed to do in their situations. King David was somebody who was known for gratitude, despite the fact that he was being chased and nearly, you know, nearly killed multiple times, but he was always thankful. Wisdom and discernment. We know King Solomon, he always did his best to discern well, and he was able to lead his entire kingdom in the right way and patience and hard work. So all of these stories, because I I read the Bible many times while I was in graduate school, these helped me and they supported me when I was going through difficulties because they reminded me that, you know what, this is already a solved problem. People have already gone through this. You just have to take what they've done, even though it's hard, and make it your reality. But there are also anti-patterns, right? So I've talked about design patterns. There's also patterns in the Bible that show us what not to do. And this also helped me avoid unnecessary pain and suffering, right? King Josiah is somebody that, you know, he rushed to conclusions. You know, if I rushed to conclusions, uh, I would receive it from my students in no time. They, you know, if I just say, oh, you know, these people don't know what they're talking about. And I ask for feedback and I just assume they don't know what they're talking about. There's no way I could be a good instructor that way. And I realized that many times that students did help me a lot to fix my character and to also help me to understand everything from their point of view. Jealousy and hatred, arrogance and willful blindness, complaining and grumbling, right? So everybody knows that these are wrong. But what's amazing about these stories in the Bible is that when you read it, you understand why they grumbled. And you understand from their point of view, oh, I might grumble the same way. So if you read it in that way, you'll be able to also solve this problem that you may have. I'm sure we all grumble a little bit. Uh, so it's, it's something that you can really clearly see oneself. Okay, so what am I trying to say here? The Bible, it is this book full of patterns and anti-patterns. And this image here on the left shows how connected the Bible is, right? This is actually an image of Genesis to Revelation. And you'll see all of these arrows represents where these verses are, are actually referencing other verses in the Bible, right? So the amazing thing about the Bible is even when you understand one story, If you understand all these other stories, you can also get insight into what happened in some other part of the Bible, because they all are connected in one way or another, and it all represents the same reality and the same God. So when you can actually look at it like that, then you can make these amazing connections and make it fit your life situation even more specifically at each time and be able to solve these kinds of problems. So, yes... Interpreting the Bible is difficult. I wanted to add that in here. This is the thing that it takes time and you have to learn it. Uh, But when you can, you're able to dissect the situations that you're in. You're able to ultimately solve them as well. Okay. So that's it for today. Thank you so much uh, for actually listening uh, to this talk. So if you guys have any questions, you guys can scan this QR code right here, I believe, and you'll be able to go to a place where you can ask questions. Um, And if you guys are... Yes, interested in learning similar things that I learned. I believe the survey will have something like that. But thank you guys for giving me this chance to talk about my stories. Awesome. Thank you, Garrett. Dr. Professor, Minister Garrett. <laughs> um, I think there was, there, there was so much we could take from that. Um, I just really you know, appreciate it, enjoyed how you you know, making the Bible practical, making the Bible practical to our everyday lives, right? And I think especially for those um, Old Testament stories, you know, too often we, we kind of skip over those 
maybe we listen to them in a Sunday school sort of thing. And it's almost like a fairy tale, but it's like, there's so much to, there's so much to really unpack there. Right. Um, so yeah, like Garrett said, uh, it's in the chat or this QR code here, feel free to submit um, questions. And in just a second, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll put Garrett on the hot seat. Um, <laughs> I have to say, I relate to you also being very good at not eating fruit. <laughs> <laughs> so Great life lesson. <laughs> All right, we got a couple questions rolling in. Feel free to continue um, posting questions as we're talking, but. Um, all right, first question for you, Dr. Van Hoy. Um, you, you touched on this a little bit, but I think it's I think it's a question a lot of people have, or you know have have either had themselves or have been asked. Um, and the question is, what do you say to people who who claim that there are like irreconcilable differences between you know religion and science? Yes, uh, yes, definitely a question that I had myself. <laughs> uh, definitely something I've also heard. Um, it's, a, it's a really packed question. Um, and so I guess I, I yeah, to, to tackle this one, I maybe like to split it into kind of two different things. I think, you know, science as people normally think about it, there's the scientific method. And then there's like science or it's basically all the knowledge and understanding of the universe that science has revealed up until now. So the scientific method itself, um, I think there are many people who would claim that the Bible kind of is against the scientific method. But uh, one thing that I would like to point out about that is uh, even understanding the Bible, I think God advocates for understanding his word in a kind of scientific way throughout the Bible. Right. If you read it carefully, from the first chapter, there is misunderstanding of what God said and what he meant. You know, Adam and Eve immediately misunderstood what God said. And in the Old Testament, God also says something like, hey, because you reject knowledge, I reject you as my priests. Right? And he says that also, again, in the, you know, in the New Testament through Apostle Paul, he says, hey, you know I write letters because I, he talked about letters that he wrote to the churches and he said, yeah, it's hard to understand. It doesn't mean you need to forcefully interpret it. Um, you know, if you can't understand, just leave it there. So in science and the scientific method, we are trained to not make a, a conclusion, right? You make a hypothesis. I think the Bible means this. I think this is what God means. And then you're supposed to verify aka experiment that that actually makes sense and then through that you build your faith right and so time and time again in the bible i believe god has advocated for this precise method uh, of understanding his word right and so i don't see uh, that as a contradiction but the other part i think is where people typically see contradiction is with what religious leaders say in science mm. because what you see in the bible is that God himself actually separ separates religious leaders from himself. <laughs> but he does that many times to point out that, hey, you know, you guys worship me. That's great. You believe in me. Amen, obviously. But you got to do it the right way, right? There's actually something you're, su you're supposed to do correctly. And so, um, you know, basically, when we look at the Bible, it's supposed to not have contradictions. Even God says that in the Bible. Hey, I don't change. All right, because if I changed over time, then how would you possibly live this life? So I, you know, again, without going into too much detail here, one of the constraints that should be applied when, apply, when interpreting the Bible is that it should all be one cohesive logic and reasonable thing. And also it should reflect the reality that we live. Mm -hmm. And God advocates for that many times throughout the Bible. Uh, but yeah, it can be tricky to be clear. So I think uh, people may say, yeah, it's irreconcilable, <laughs> but I think that, you know, if you look at it in a different way, I think it can be reconciled. Very insightful. Thank you. Um, okay. Another one. Um, do you have any examples of ways that you've applied, you know, the word of God, the Bible to your research or your teaching curriculum? Oh, hmm. 
Very interesting. Applying the word of God to my research or my teaching curriculum. Um, yeah, I think my teaching curriculum is one thing that I've, that I've absolutely uh, incorporated certain things from the Bible. So for example, so I can't say the content itself as much. Uh, at least I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but the method of teaching, right? We call this pedagogy in, uh, in teaching circles, like the method of teaching. So, you know, one philosophy that I actually got an inspiration from the Bible about is give more and expect more. And this is something that has guided the way I teach and do many other things, right? So what does it mean to give more and expect more? Because I saw the way professors teach a lot of them, the way they teach is they give you nothing, AKA they don't try to teach you or they don't, they don't really give you materials. And then they give you this amazingly hard test and say 30%. And they're like, Hey, okay. So, you know, I got something like that. So they basically, you know, give you nothing and they expect everything. Then there are others that, you know, they give you everything and expect nothing. Uh, I think, you know, these are kind of the easy professors, which is great, but you know, there's not really the challenge there for you to grow as a person if that's the way you're going to run things. Uh, and, you know, then there's just giving less and expecting less, which is really, you're, you know, what's the point of even having class if that's the way you're going to do it, right? So the way I always ran things, because what I noticed from Jesus is that he taught people endlessly. He never held back when it came to teaching people. He never held back to being merciful to them. He never made himself unavailable throughout his entire ministry. And when they didn't do well, he didn't just let them go. You know, he actually had high expectations for them. That's why he said things like, how long have you been with me and don't know this? Right? That's a part of Jesus that not many people actually, you know, acknowledge. But yeah, he really did because he loved these people so much. He said, I expect from you. I gave you so much. So you should be able to go this far. And so also when I, when I make my curriculum, I continuously try to fit more and more and more so I can expect also more out of my students. And so that's something that I continuously try to put into what, what, I, what I teach uh, and also my teaching philosophy. Great, thank you. Good, good question there. Um, all right, this, this one might be, might be tough. I, I'm interested to, to, to get your response. Was there a specific aha moment in which you experienced God in a non-practical way, so like in a in a more spiritual way. Oh, okay. Um, yes, <laughs> in a non-practical way. So I guess in the context of this, uh, uh, you know, this talk here, I guess practical is like you know when I can make decisions. So usually that's considered practical by people. It's like something I realize to make a decision, right? But. I want to say the, the non-practical, but, you know, it's very important is receiving motivation, right? And actually receiving strength. I do think those are things that, you know, even though, even though it may not seem, uh, yeah, even though it may not seem practical at those times, but how, how do I receive those? How do I receive those kind of non-practical things? Well, I pray. Uh, and there's a story that I, that I tell people. And, um, you know, for example, there was a time in graduate school in which I was so overwhelmed by what I saw, because this is the thing, I'm a very calculating person. Like I, I you know, I don't know if Joshua was like this, but you know, I, I can see everything that I'm going to have to do in my head, like all of this stuff, it just kind of stacks up and it can be very overwhelming. And so there was a time in which, you know, even though I sure I could have, you know, used my strategy and everything like this, I knelt down in prayer and the only thing that I had to ask God was one question, but I, I didn't want to ask it right away because I was forming my heart to ask it because I wanted to ask God really seriously. What was that question? I asked him, is it even possible? That's all I wanted to know is, is what I'm thinking in my head? Because I can't explain it all to God. It's just, it's all in there. <laughs> I even, I have to ask, is all of this in my head? You know, is it even possible? That's all I want to know, because if it's possible, then I can do it, right? But then as soon as I asked it, I heard this voice that said, you can, right? And I actually thought about that story of Joshua again. It's just, he's a great inspiration to me. And it melted my heart. What I thought was going to be impossible immediately at that moment, I changed my attitude. And I was able to say, you know what? 
enough with this thinking of whether it's possible or not. I'm going to make it happen even if it doesn't, even if I can't think about how to do it right now. Right. And so in that sense, you know, that was a very spiritual experience for me. I, I hope that kind of qualifies uh, to, to answer the question. But I want to say there are also many of those experiences where it wasn't just, you know, I, I read the Bible and, you know, here's the answer kind of thing. But it came to me out of nowhere, right? And I really can't explain exactly, you know, what, where that came from. But uh, after reading the Bible, I get those kinds of inspirations a lot as well. So, Great. Yeah. Thank you for opening up a bit about um, some of your stories. Um, all right, last question, and I'll, I'll be honest, this, this is my question. I asked the <laughs> same question uh, last week, but I want to get your perspective. You know, coming from, from your pr- profession, um, you know, what tips or tricks do you have for kind of sharing your faith in the workplace? Because I would imagine, you know, particularly as a professor, um, you know, you build these relationships with your students, but I would imagine there's, you know, restrictions on what you can and can't say and, and, and certain, certain things like that. So just kind of curious what your experience has been. Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, obviously I want to share with them everything. <laughs> you know, I, I really want them because, you know, I see them struggling. Yeah. And, and when I see them struggle, you know, secretly tears flow down my eyes when they're not looking, right? Because I see it as, I need to help them, right? And uh, yeah, there's been a few times where, you know, students are in my office really facing a crisis of the class, but I ask them immediately, how is everything else? Right? How is everything else? I'm sure you're not doing well in this class because there's something behind it. It's never that it's just what, it's never just that you're not smart enough or, you know, maybe you're not managing your time well. But, um, you know, when I get a chance to t- talk to students at that level, which is, you know, it's, it's usually during difficult times during the semester, which is usually at the end or in the middle. Yeah, at that time, I will ask them, I was like, you know what, you know, I went through difficulties just like you, because I did, even though it was easy in some ways for me, still even undergraduate was very difficult in other ways. And I'm sure it's the same way for other people. And so, you know, for students, I was able to open up at those times where I said, you know what, I don't know if you believe in God. I don't know if you're even interested in God. But I know that if you learn from the Bible and you believe in God, it solved similar problems to what you're doing. And yeah, for some people, they enjoy that and they're interested. And for some, they're not. And in the workplace, too, I want to say, you know, how I've done that, because it's different worries and concerns uh, than in school. Yeah, typically it's done outside of work. Right. But I have never I never teach us. I never teach the Bible to a student who is currently my student. Now, that's something that as a rule, I'm not, I'm not allowed to do. And it's also kind of becomes a conflict of interest. But yes, I have, you know, friends who can teach the Bible and I can simply recommend they, they go learn. Um, and I think that's kind of how I go about it. No, good perspective. I appreciate that. I try to steal a little bit from everyone's ideas so that I can. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that, that's great. It's great to see. Um, yeah, I can imagine as a professor, you know, you have that opportunity to to build those relationships and to really, you know, goes beyond just, you know, information that you're delivering during during the class time. But um, all right, well, that's all our questions. Uh, doctor, you're off the hot seat. Um, <laughs> once again, you know, we can't thank you enough. Um, we really appreciate um, your presentation today. Um, I hope if anyone's, you know, interested in getting in touch with Garrett, you saw his uh, email address there. Um, but also we're going to put a, a survey in the chat and, um, you know, a couple different things here with the survey. Uh, we'd love to get in touch with you, especially if you, you know, are joining us for the first time. Um, this is our last installment, but we are, uh, we are in the process of putting together, I'll call it, you know, series two. Um, <laughs> See if I can make a no. I'm not even trying to make a name on the spot. <laughs> Convergence, life, and faith, part two. We we do a, we are formulating plans for that. So um, you know, keep a lookout for that. If someone invited you here, um, I'm sure they'll be in touch. Um, you know, or uh, put your contact information in the um, in the survey. Um, also, we just love to hear you know your perspective, what you liked, what you di- didn't like. You know, feel free to be be open and honest because all it's going to do is help us to you know, help us to improve, to do better next time. You know, any ideas you may have, topics you want to explore, um, we'd love to hear it. And, and also an opportunity in there to, um, you know, Garrett mentioned uh, 
you know, kind of the Bible studies that he was involved with, you know, we offer something similar. So if, if, if that's something that, you know, you're looking to, to dive in a little bit deeper with many of the topics that uh, Garrett talked about today, you know, that's, that's also an opportunity. Um, but with that, uh, a little bit bittersweet, but uh, I think that concludes our, 